Thank you, Sherry. Um, Paul, thank you so much for the series that you started and the series that I'm honored to participate in. So thank you for being here tonight, and I hope you enjoy what we talk about. It's so good to see you. Okay, um, I'm actually going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and why wouldn't I if I'm giving a talk in such a large venue? This is absolutely one of the most wonderful stories, I think, that uh, we have today, um, especially with regard to understanding our origins and understanding something about the world in which we live. So this is going to be a fun exploration, I hope. It is fun for me, and so hopefully it'll be fun for you as well. Um, I'm going to, this is the brief outline of what I plan to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to start with a brief history of the universe. Brief. Uh, we're going to talk about symmetry. Now, symmetry is an overarching uh, theme for the talk tonight. Symmetry and its importance in the evolution of the universe. We're going to talk about Big Bang cosmogenesis, how the uh, Big Bang brought about the laws of physics, the forces we have, and the particles. Sounds like an ambitious project, and in fact it is, but many, many uh, very, very bright individuals have worked on this through the years, and we have some, uh, some uh, focused understanding that continues to get better as the years go by. We're going to talk briefly about particles and nuclei, and then we're going to end with a discussion of nuclear astrophysics and talk specifically about uh, the elements out of which we're made, how they come about, and um, some, of the, some of how it dovetails to the research that we do uh, at Michigan State University. So let's start with the question, what's the world made of? Um, the world's made of 12 particles and four forces, plus a recently discovered Higgs particle. And lest you think that the Higgs is the crack in the door to lots and lots of other particles, it's not. The Higgs was anticipated for about 20 years. There may be other scalar particles as well, Higgs-like particles, and that won't um, disturb the, the theory, but I will say a few words about the Higgs in just a brief moment. And really, with such a handful of, uh, such a simple handful of particles and four forces, if you were handed those and, and God were to say to you, here, make a nice, diverse, interesting universe, how would we do that with 12 particles and four forces? It's absolutely astounding. Uh, what, we, what we understand to be the origins of the universe, and yet we look around us and see the diversity that we have. Matter consists of quark matter, um, fermions, uh, matter that, that corresponds to the mass of objects, and those are made of quarks and leptons. And then there are exchange particles, a class of particles that mediate the four forces that we know of. Admittedly, we're talking about a very small portion of the universe because, as we know it now, the visible universe, the universe that, that interacts electromagnetically, is actually a very small portion of what actually exists out there. And we're, we're discovering this even as we speak. Dark energy was uh, understood and discovered in 1998. That's how recent it was. We still don't know what dark energy is. We don't know what dark matter is. We're probably further along in our study of the dark matter than we are in dark energy. And I'm not going to say much about this tonight except to acknowledge that we're talking about a sliver of creation, but plenty of work to do for the future, no doubt. Um, this is an interesting slide because I want to, to, for us to think about what it, what it requires to dissociate the various um, stages of matter. We have molecules, and that's the realm of chemistry. We have atoms. If we focus in on one of those atoms in the molecule, we see atoms are made of a nucleus and clouds of electrons surrounding them. If we then zoom into the nucleus, we see that it's made of individual particles, nucleons, which are quark matter. And if we zero in on one of those nucleons, we see quark matter. And my point in showing this diagram is not only to indicate the uh, sequential levels of detail, but to indicate that there are different heats or different temperatures at which these particles dissociate. Molecules dissociate at temperatures that we can produce in a room. If we burn something, we are um, causing chemical reactions to happen, bonds to break, because they break at temperatures that we can produce in a room. It's a little harder to cause an atom to come apart. Atoms can be ionized, but it takes a fair amount of energy to do so. Uh, they become ionized through regular processes like ultraviolet radiation, X-ray radiation, but uh, it's even harder to dissociate a nucleus, and for that we need an accelerator. Uh, even though nuclei spontaneously decay and some spontaneously fission, that's not really what we're talking about. If we want to dissociate a nucleus, we have to create energies that are several tens to hundreds of MeV. And then finally, uh, just recently we've uh, constructed a facility out on Long Island in New York called the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, that can now begin to un unravel or take apart the individual nucleons and understand something about the quark substructure. 
Um, when we talk about the universe and its evolution, we're going to be going backwards from very hot temperatures to very cool. So ordinary matter, that is uh, daily matter, consists primarily of protons, neutrons, and electrons. <coughs> protons and neutrons are made out of quarks, the most common variety of quarks, up and down quarks. And as you can see here, uh, the proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark, and a neutron consists of two down quarks and an up quark. And at the beginning, in the universe's uh, birthing stage, equal numbers of ups and down quarks were made, and therefore equal numbers of neutrons and protons. We'll see what happened to, the, to them in just a moment. And then there are the leptons, the most common of which is the electron. And this, these three make up ordinary matter. Um, the stuff that I didn't mention um, is a very active topic in research right now, and, but it's a very interesting one because what I say tonight is going to be influenced somewhat by what we discover about dark matter and dark energy. Uh, the discovery the, of dark matter really happened with the re research of Vera Rubin, who studied the galactic rotations of galaxies and realized that they did not follow Newtonian trajectories. In other words, Newtonian based on the law of gravity, 1 over r squared, the rotation of galaxies should have been very different. But basically, the rotation rate, the angular vo velocity, does not depend on radius. So all the way out to the very edge of the galaxy, the whole galaxy rotates in a way that's non-Newtonian. And she posited the possibility of dark matter, and from there, it became a very rich field as we discovered other uh, evidences for dark matter, including in large galactic clusters. The very motion of galactic clusters could not be understood by the mass of the galaxies alone, but required some other galactic, or excuse me, gravitational uh, mass to be present. Okay, so let's move on to symmetry. Now this is an interesting topic, um, a little bit counterintuitive for those of you that maybe haven't thought about symmetry. We think of high symmetry as being a device or an object that has lots of axes and lots of beautiful repetition. But in a physicist's mind, that's actually very low symmetry. The highest symmetry possible is the symmetry that requires the least number of parameters or variables to describe a system. So um, this is where my title comes from, by the way. Unity and simplicity is uh, the idea that there's unity in nature. There's very few forces, very few particles, very few laws of physics, and yet there is incredible diversity. And so unity I associate with simplicity. The simplicity of a handful of particles is um, deceptively simple uh, until we consider the diversity in the universe. Diversity, on the other hand, is associated with complexity. And complexity is what we see around us as manifest by the interactions of matter in nature. Complexity in chemical elements, the number of periodic table elements we have. Complexity in the way those elements interact and chemically and atomically. Uh, complexity in the solar system, and most notably, complexity in the biosphere. Um, we're not going to address the topic of life tonight unless my esteemed colleague in biology would like to talk about life as part of the conversation, but man, talk about diversity. Um, okay, so a soccer ball has very high symmetry. It's a sphere. How many axes do you need to orient this ball? You can't. The ball cannot be oriented in as much as it's a sphere. There are no axes to this system. It's a sphere. It has very high symmetry. On the other hand, a football is the morphing of a basketball into one in which there is a primary axis. That symmetry breaking, the breaking of that sphere into an elongated device, is a step down in sym symmetry and a step up in complexity. So the ball now has an axis along which it's oriented. And if you want to fast forward to an object that has very low symmetry, very high complexity, uh, that might be a snowflake, for example, that has many axes, many degrees of freedom, that have to be specified, many variables, in order to understand that very complex system. So let's talk with a, another system in analogy to this, and that is water. Uh, very high symmetry exists in water vapor. Again, it's, it's got spherical symmetry. There's no particular direction that specifies the cloud of vapor, uh, if you're deep within that cloud. Uh, but once water liquefies at a lower temperature, and, and by the way, that cloud is, is not at hot temperature. It's actually condensed water droplets in the cloud, but it serves for our purpose. It's effectively vapor. But if you boil water and you form a vapor, a true vapor, it's very, very hot. As it cools, it condenses into water. And that water lacks some of the symmetry that that vapor has. Why? Well, for one thing, it now has a surface. And it has surface tension. And that surface means that it has a surface normal. So there's a vector, at least in, in the presence of gravity. But even in the presence of no gravity, you would have spherical droplets. And those spherical droplets have a radius as, a, so, as opposed to um, sort of a, an amorphous vapor that doesn't have any dimensions associated with it in as much as it's a large vapor. But the water droplet has a dimension. 
Now create ice. Not only on the molecular scale do you know how the symmetry breaking. By the way, I should mention that there is a symmetry breaking in going from hydrogen and oxygen to the water vapor because the oxygens and hydrogens have no relationship to one another, and then they're bound at an angle of 105 degrees when H2O is formed. So there's a symmetry breaking associated with a cooling. And then when that water forms a vapor, it cools into water. That's a symmetry breaking, and ultimately into ice. And there, there's a long-term axial symmetry in many different directions as that crystal lattice is produced. So this is low symmetry, and it's also high complexity. Several axes are needed to understand the crystal structure of water, and it has high complexity. So there's this notion of simplicity involved with high symmetry, and as we lose that symmetry through symmetry breakings, it becomes more complex with lower symmetry. I should also mention that in physics, symmetries are associated with conservation laws. Uh, we know about the, uh, the conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum, and these three conservation laws are associated with symmetries. The symmetry with which we understand energy conservation to be associated with is the symmetry of the laws of physics in time. Wait a little while and the laws of physics don't change, and that's associated with energy conservation. The connection is a lot deeper than I'm giving it credence, but it is a connection that in the physics community we understand. Momentum is a conserved quantity, and it has to do with the fact that the laws of physics here are the same as they are over here. They're translationally invariant. And finally, the conservation of angular momentum is associated with the isotropy of space. It doesn't matter what direction I choose, the laws of physics are the same in all directions. So, and it's true in, in the universe as well, as we look at these symmetries, there are conservations that are broken as these symmetries become broken. Okay, and symmetry breakings are also associated with phase transitions. And the most notable phase transition we can come up with daily is like the idea of ice crystal formation. That's a phase transition from liquid to solid. Here's a couple of other quick examples of symmetry that's broken. A pencil that's balanced on its tip, imagine a perfect pencil that doesn't have like specks of dust on the table that might influence the way it falls. If that's a perfect pencil with perfect cylindrical symmetry, uh, if eventually it falls down, it's because it's been perturbed in some way. The system that has no horizontal axis now has one as the pencil lies down, and that specifies a new direction. Likewise, if the ball falls off the top of a hill, it falls in some direction. Say it's a three-dimensional hill, it falls off in some direction, that's now a new axis that specifies the system that did not exist before. And if you sit down at a table and the glasses are sitting in exactly in between you and your neighbor, and if you don't know about etiquette, you don't know which one you're supposed to grab, you just grab one and everybody else grabs them likewise and you've broken the symmetry of that table. Now, uh, in these examples, by the way, in a real life macroscopic system, there's something that breaks the symmetry that you can identify. It's a breeze in the air. Or it's something that, or a person that makes a choice. But in the symmetry breakings in the universe, the evolution of the big, from the Big Bang onward, they're called spontaneous symmetry breaking. They don't have a cause. It's simply a matter of chance that it broke in a certain way. Uh, not necessarily just chance, but we don't understand. There's nothing that came from without and perturbed it and knocked it in a particular direction. These symmetry breakings might be inherent in the fabric of the material that that burst forth in the Big Bang. But they're called spontaneous because they're not broken by something outside the system. Uh, here's a couple of symmetries that are worth noting. Symmetries that we know about today that are broken. Um, CPT it starts for charge, stands for charge parity time. Um, and these are three individual symmetries. Charge symmetry means that if you have a, a microscopic process that happens, reverse all the charges and ask yourself, does it happen in nature? If it does, then you've got charge symmetry. An atom and an anti-atom are an example of <clears throat> An atom that exists and is stable, and an antiatom that exists and is stable. The antiatom consists of an antiproton and an antineutron, say making up helium, and an antielectron, positron, uh, bound to that antinucleus. Anti There's no reason why we can't build that in nature. So the electromagnetic force obeys the charge conjugation. You can reverse all the charges and you have a viable system that exists in nature. Parity, you can think of as mirror symmetry. Can you reflect every point through the origin? in all three dimensions and get a system that is viable in this world. It turns out parity violation or parity symmetry is violated. In other words, parity symmetry is not a good symmetry. It's a pretty good symmetry, but there are interactions, for example, the weak interaction that breaks the symmetry of the weak interaction. And then there's time. Time symmetry means can you run the film backwards and can you see something that can actually happen in nature? 
You know, you can watch the film of a burning log and then turn it backwards and watch all the smoke coming in and building up some wood. And you ask yourself, can that happen? And the answer is no, but it's really because of thermodynamics, not because of the laws of nature. The laws of nature would allow that. Uh, if I spill water out of my cup and it bounces on the floor, if for some reason I could see that the floor would give an extra boost to that water, there's nothing wrong with the forces getting reversed and causing the water to come back into that cup. So those are not true symmetry breakings. Uh, they are simply the way the world works on a macroscopic scale with thermodynamics. But there are fundamental symmetry breakings, and Madame Chang Xiang Wu discovered a parity violation in the beta, beta decay of cobalt 60. And there's a process where when it decays, you cannot change the charge, or excuse me, the parity of the situation and get something that happens in nature. It simply doesn't happen in nature. I'm going to show a slide in just a moment about that. Later, after she discovered parity violation, the combination of charge and parity violation was, was discovered in uh, the kaon decay, which is an exotic particle. The kaon decays in a way that violates CP symmetry. And by implication, if CPT is a good symmetry, which all physicists believe, well, I can't speak for all, but the majority of physicists consider CPT violation impossible, that the symmetry is good, that it cannot be violated, then that would imply, if CP is violated, that time reversal asymmetry is also violated, meaning that there are microscopic processes that depend on the flow of time as to how they interact. You do not find the reverse time process happening in nature. Now, most of um, microscopic or um, small interactions, uh, subatomic interactions, happen both forward and backwards. And in fact, Richard, Richard Feynman posited that a positron, an anti-electron, is nothing but an electron moving backwards in time. And the physics works beautifully to see antiparticles as being particles moving backward in time. And Feynman diagrams are based on that understanding. Here's just a brief uh, picture of the cobalt parity violation that Madame Wu found. And I found this diagram on the web. I thought it was kind of cute. The mirror image of Madame Wu doing her experiment. Um, basically, the decay of cobalt decays particles, beta particles, more in one direction than the other relative to its spin. So if you uh, view the nuclear spin as the uh, vertical axis here and the rotational sense in the image we see here as uh, counterclockwise is seen from above, the mirror image is going to see that spin as clockwise from above, and yet the decay particles will still decay in the downward direction. The mirror image of a particle moving downward is still downward. I don't want to dwell on this very long, but it's, it's an example of parity violation. If parity were conserved in this decay, you would see as many beta particles going along the direction of the polarization or the spin as go anti-parallel to that spin. But the fact that more go in one direction than the other is a violation, and it's mediated by the weak interaction, which is the one of the four forces that has the most uh, violations or symmetry violations associated with it. All right, so let's talk about the universe. Now that we've talked about symmetries, the universe at its inception was the most symmetric state it ever has been. And in fact, you could see it as maybe perfect symmetry. At the moment of the singularity we call the Big Bang, it was an explosion or, or a, a body of material, it's even hard to use the word material, uh, that had the highest symmetry possible. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at the time scales with which physicists talk with no tongue in cheek about the evolution of the universe. We talk about things like 10 to the minus 46 seconds after the Big Bang. That's called the Planck epoch or epoch. Uh, they, they don't even, you know, smile and say, I know you probably aren't going to believe this, but we think we know what happened at 10 to the minus 36 seconds. It's, it seems audacious, but there's reasons uh, uh, up to about a microsecond. We understand what happened from a microsecond onward because we can do those experiments in accelerators, but we can't actually probe at those very earliest times. But putting everything together in the way the laws of physics work, we have a fairly good idea. Um, so the four forces of nature started out as one. And when they split, the universe continued to cool. And that was the first thing that happened, by the way. The four forces of nature split, and then quarks were produced. And then hadron hadronization happened, where the quarks actually combined to form particles. But as the universe cooled, it went through several phase transitions, several symmetry breakings that brought about more and more richness out of the unity and simplicity that was the Big Bang. And just keep in mind that the entire universe came from that explosion, as the theory has it. Not only matter and energy, but space-time itself was part of what erupted in that Big Bang. So if you're picturing an explosion moving outward against a black backdrop, you've got to lose the back back black backdrop, because there was no backdrop into which this Big Bang exploded. At least this is the way our current understanding of the Big Bang is. Space and time, as we know it, were part of what came 
into existence at that Big Bang. So let's talk about cosmogenesis, the production of the laws of physics, the forces of physics, or the forces of nature, and the particles. So here we go. Let's, let's start exploring those very early periods of time in the Big Bang. For example, the very first epoch that we talk about is the Planck epoch, and that is up to 10 to the minus 43 seconds. At that time is when we believe the four forces bifurcated into, first of all, the gravity for, gravitational force and then the electroweak and strong force. They were not yet um, split at 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Shortly after that, and I use the word shortly carefully, <laughs> shortly after that, from about 10 to the minus 43 to 10 to the minus 36 seconds, uh, the forces separated through symmetry breaking phase transitions. Actually, that's the time during which the forces broke. Uh, the four forces were unified up until 10 to the minus 43 seconds, and then for a brief, very brief period of time, they separated. From 10 to the minus 36 to about 10 to the minus 12 seconds, now we're getting into a range where we feel a little more comfortable. 10 to the minus 12 seconds is a picosecond, and we can actually produce laser pulses that last a picosecond, even shorter than that. So at least these were, we're comfortable with talking about these kind of times. This is called the grand, or the electroweak epoch, and this is the time at which the strong and the electroweak forces separated, and where uh, it turns out the inflationary epoch happens if, in fact, inflation happened. We believe inflation happened. We're not going to talk about that today, but that gives rise to the, the massive uniformity we see throughout the universe. We believe that there was a period of incredible inflation after which the universe slowed down and then proceeded along its way as it cooled. Uh, here's the four forces of nature. This is kind of a diagram that shows you the time on the y-axis and the splitting of the four forces on the x. Notice at about 10 to the minus 10 seconds is when the four become separate. And from that moment onward to the rest of the universe till today, 13.7 billion years later, the four forces have existed and have interacted with one another. But they happen through a series of symmetry breakings to the familiar forces that we have today. Um, let me just say a word about the relative strengths of the forces because this is an absolutely remarkable thing. Um, when you really look carefully at the way nature is constructed, you cannot help but be absolutely fascinated with what I call remarkable convergences. Some people call fine-tuning, and those are both very fine uh, descriptions. But remarkable convergences of the strengths. We think it's very odd that gravity is 10 to the minus 38 times weaker than the strong force. That's a huge number, 10 to the minus 38. I, it's not able to be grasped with the human mind. The weak force is 10 million times weaker. That's something we can imagine. And the electromagnetic force is about 10 to the minus 3 or about 1 1,000th the strength of the strong force. Why would the gravity force be as weak as it is? Well, we'll see later on how the evolution of stars, the evolution of the nucleosynthesis that happens in them, depends upon a careful, detailed balance between gravitational pressure and radiation pressure outwards. Were it not for this uh, strength scale, we would not have stars that either produce the heavy elements that we need, nor produce the long, steady periods of time that will allow life to grow and develop and evolve into species that can then reflect on the existence of those forces. Okay, so let's continue. Now this is going into the early epoch. We were in the very early epoch. Now we're in the early epoch of the universe. Um, taking up from where we left off, uh, when the weak and the electromagnetic forces separated so that we then had four, um, quarks also froze out of, the, uh, out of the, the fireball. Think of how ice crystals form when you cool down water. Water is amorphous and without symmetry, and suddenly somewhere in that vat of water, a little ice crystal starts growing. Well, the ice crystal represents a solid form of water that came out of the liquid. Think of quarks as the particles that freeze out of the energy ball of the Big Bang. And that happened very, very soon after the beginning. So we have quark creation, but they are not yet cool enough to stick to one another and form hadrons. Hadrons are the subset of matter that consists of quark matter. So after that comes the hadron epoch from about 10 to the minus 6 or 1 millionth of a second to about 1 second, during which the quark gluon plasma, the plasma of quarks and gluons, was able to start congealing into quark triplets and quark doublets. Quark triplets form quark matter that, that uh, forms the nucleons of the nucleus, baryons, uh, the baryons are the quark triplets, and then the mesons are the quark doublets. I'll have a little more to say about them later, but those formed up to about one second. So, you know, you get this big explosion, and these pop, pop, pop quarks into existence, and then they start collecting into trios, triplets, and doublets, all in one second. Then comes the lepton epoch, which is about one to ten seconds. That's where the leptons, which consist of the electrons 
and the uh, neutrinos and the muons and the tauons, the, the family of particles called leptons. At the very beginning, I mentioned how there were 12 particles and four forces. The 12 particles are six quarks, three families of quarks, the up-down, the charm strange, and the top-bottom. And then there are three families of quarks, the electron and the electron or er, leptons. The electron and the electron neutrino, the muon, the muon neutrino, and the tauon, and the tauon neutrino. Those are the 12 particles. And then the four gauge particles, which represent the mediators of the strong and the weak and the gravitational or electromagnetic force, are the other that make up those 12. And then there's the Higgs boson. And I'll say something about the Higgs boson in a bit. Um, OK, so then we move into, after the leptons are produced, pop, 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 a lot of particles pop into existence as the universe continues to cool. Then we have what's called the photon epoch. Now this really, I, I get so tickled when I see this because it lasts from 10 seconds to 380,000 years. <laughs> you know, a little bit of a step up here. You know, like somebody's impatient says, okay, let's get this moving. Come on, let's, <laughs> let's move toward, toward today, please, because at this rate, we're never going to get to today. So the photon epoch lasted from 10 seconds to 380,000. Now what characterizes the photon epoch? It's the epoch where photons dominate the universe, meaning Atoms haven't formed yet. The universe is still too, too hot to allow electrons to stick to nucleons. We're going to speak in a moment about nucleogenesis in the Big Bang, which happened up to about 20 minutes. But up to 380,000 years, there were no atoms. Therefore, photons interact with ions very easily. And they're constantly bumping into ions, and they can't go very far. The universe is not yet transparent. But at 380,000 years, finally, the universe cooled to a point where electrons could finally stick to nuclei become atoms, and then all of a sudden the universe became transparent. I would love to have been there to see that happen. All of a sudden, you see long distances. Because then the photons can travel long distance. They don't interact with neutral particles, i.e. atoms, nearly as strongly as they do with charged particles. So the photon epoch takes us quite a ways into the future. Now, let's talk for a moment about that first 20 minutes. Um, this is a remarkable and a rich period of time in the history of the universe because it turns out that protons and neutrons were produced in equal number. However, the neutron is slightly heavier than the proton. Now, we know from Einstein that E equals mc squared. What that translates into is that the energy of the neutron is slightly higher, the mass energy, than the proton. Therefore, it is possible that it might decay into a proton. And that's allowed by the laws of physics, by the strong and the weak force. The weak force, in particular, allows for the neutron to decay. A neutron left all to itself decays in about 10 minutes. Its half-life is about 10 minutes. On the other hand, if it's stuck to a proton as part of a nucleus, it lives effectively forever. So during that first few minutes of the Big Bang, neutrons decayed. Now, neutrons consist of two down quarks and an up quark, and protons, two up quarks and a down quark. So there's symmetry between up quarks and down quarks. But if we have a number of neutrons decaying into protons, notice we now have a preponderance not only of protons, but up quarks. So this is what happened. From the Big Bang to about three minutes, we have the history that we've just reviewed. Starting at about three minutes, the, the temperature is cool enough now so that individual protons and neutrons can start sticking together. Now imagine the scene. All of these neutrons are starting to pop out of existence and turn into protons. Even though the half-life is 10 minutes, the, num the number is enormous. So immediately you start seeing all these neutrons popping into protons and disappearing. So we've got this huge shift toward proton-rich universe and a neutron-poor universe. But some of the neutrons are starting to stick to those protons and form deuterons. And this continues to happen as the universe cools. And some of those deuterons stick to form helium-4. And this little chart here shows, in a very concise way, how that uh, nucleogenesis happens in the Big Bang. Neutron and a proton form a deuteron, which can form a triton, which can form helium-4. All of these intermixed uh, interactions can happen to form this heavier matter. And by the time of 20 minutes, that's when the stop bell happens and everybody stops. All the nucleosynthesis stops because now the universe is continuing to cool, and it's cool enough so that they don't stick together. Why don't they stick together? Because they electrostatically repel one another. They're nuclei. They're positively charged. All we have are positive charges and neutral charges. One might ask, well, why was the universe so positive? Well, that had to do with another symmetry breaking earlier in the universe. It's a profound one. It's a matter-antimatter asymmetry. You know, we believe in the, in the, the Big Bang, antimatter and matter were produced in equal numbers. But now we have a matter-dominated universe, and we don't know what the symmetry breaking that might have caused that is. But anyway, by the time the 20 minutes is over, we have about 75% hydrogen and about 25% helium. 
The helium is produced by those lucky neutrons that could safely stick to a proton. The other ones said, I give up, decay into a proton, and become hydrogen. And maybe they'll stick to a neutron and form deuterium later on. But notice, 75% hydrogen is all hydrogen. 25% helium, helium is half hydrogen and half protons. So this is now largely proton dominated. There are much fewer neutrons. But this ratio of hydrogen and helium is going to be crucial for the activity and life cycle of stars. OK, so even today, we see, if we look out in the universe, we have 25% hydrogen, or excuse me, 75% uh, hydrogen, 25% helium, and a, just a tiny little sprinkling of heavy elements. Here on Earth, we have a lot more, but our Earth is a very small portion of the universe. Um, and as it turns out, massive stars depend on this ratio. They need hydrogen fuel. They need to burn quickly. But they also need to move on. Well, we, actually, we need. The stars don't need. We need for the stars to burn the heavier elements as well so we can produce the periodic table and so we can have nitrogen and phosphorus and calcium and iron and all those things that are important for life. So for massive stars, it turns out this ratio is really helpful because as the star first starts burning hydrogen, and I've got to move very quickly here because I see my time is quickly disappearing, um, as the hydrogen forms helium, the helium needs to burn to form heavier elements. And this ratio, just take my word for it, is very important. It's also very important for the low to medium mass stars because that ratio is what allows them to live for billions of years and go through their cycles. And billions of years is necessary for life. Not only do you need the ingredients, you need the time. I'm going to zip through this rather quickly because it's not important that we understand particles and nuclei. These are just some of the centers around the world where these particles, quarks, leptons, mesons, baryons, nuclei, and atoms are studied. They're CERN in Europe. Uh, RIC, relative heavy ion, Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider in New York, that studies stuff that's down the, the ladder a little bit. Hadrons, mesons, and baryons are studied in Virginia at um, the Jefferson Lab. And finally, this is where we do our research. This is the nuclear structure, or excuse me, um, the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab at Michigan State. And there's where we study baryons and nuclei. We want to study the nuclei and the substructure to some extent of those nuclei by their interactions. Some of the elements of nuclear Nuclear physics, uh, they're made of protons and neutrons. They're bound by mesons. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. We really don't need to. But that's what a nucleus kind of looks like, according to you know, the way we can draw it, the way we imagine it. It's a lot more complicated. And here's the periodic table of the nuclear physicist. What we're, do is, what we're doing here is we're charting uh, the proton number versus the neutron number. Neutron number on the vertical, proton number on the horizontal. And this big island you see here is the matter island. Nothing exists out here. There are no combinations of protons and neutrons that exist to the left or the right. The black ones going up the center are the stable elements, the ones that we find in this room that are not radioactive. The ones surrounding them that are colored are all of the radioactive species we know about. And so this gives us sort of a panoramic view of the periodic table. Horizontally is one element. And so for z equals 50, those uh, elements right there, which is tin, uh, those are the isotopes of tin, the various isotopes, which are the nuclei of tin that have different neutron number. And here's a close-up view of the light region, the very bottom region of the chart of the nuclides. Here, the blue ones are the stable species. Red and, and gold and green and white specify what their typical lifetimes are. But they're all radioactive. If they're on the left side of the what we call the line of stability, they beta decay. They positron decay. And if they're on the right side, they beta decay. OK. so. Um, very briefly, we've already talked about binding energy, or at least we talked about the energy of the neutron. In order to understand nucleosynthesis, we need to understand that when two light particles come together, they stick together. They, they're, they're, it's an exothermic process, meaning when they stick together, they give off a photon and they end up weighing slightly less. So a deuteron weighs slightly less than a proton and a neutron. Uh, now, let's just walk through, then, some of the nuclear astrophysics that's involved in the formation of the elements inside the star. So we're going to talk about nu nuclear astrophysics and nucleosynthesis inside the star. So here's the way a star operates. It's actually quite easy. It's a ball of gas that falls together under a large gravitational interaction. It's a very large ball of gas, typically light years apart, that over time comes together, and eventually forms a ball of gas under what we call isostatic equilibrium. And this simply means that the gravitational inward pressure causes the heat of the core to rise to a temperature that allows nuclear fusion to start occurring in the center. And once nuclear fusion occurs, the outward moving radiation balances that gravity, and it lasts for upwards of you know, 10 billion years. 
that isostatic equilibrium can last a long time because there's a lot of fuel there and that star's not going anywhere and as long as it has the fuel to continue burning it'll offset that gravity but gravity is sly it waits until the very end and it always has the final word here's the periodic table of all the elements we the question we can ask is if the early universe had hydrogen and helium and just a smattering of very light elements a tiny little sprinkling where did all this come from uh, here's the abundances in the solar system. Notice how hydrogen and helium are way here, here at the top. This is a logarithmic scale, so we're talking about big differences here along the vertical. And then here's the elements that we know and love that are important for life, plus a couple out here. But notice the sharp drop-off in the abundance of those elements as you look toward heavier and heavier elements. And here's the abundances in the Earth. Uh, these green ones, these green ones are the rock-forming elements, silicon, oxygen, the things that form the, the crust and the mantle of the Earth. And then these gold ones down here are very rare. These are the rarest of metals, tellurium, uh, palladium, osmium, iridium, platinum, gold. Those are both rare. But the question we can ask is where do they come from? And here's a picture of many, many nuclear furnaces. These are factories where nuclei are produced. So this is where we understand the production of those elements to occur, from the original hydrogen and helium to all the heavy elements that we need in order to sustain life. Here's one of those birthing grounds. This is the greater nebula in Orion. There is a cluster of young stars, merely a couple of million years old, in that cradle, and they're, they're right at the very beginning of their lives. And now, this, you know, this nebula is quite a ways away, so we're seeing something that happened a while ago. But those stars are still there, they're still young, and they are continuing to coalesce the material and form not only the mature star but the solar system if there are heavy elements in the vicinity of that cloud. Here's another place where stars are being formed, right there in the center, uh, taken by the Hubble Wide Field Camera. Now, the initial reactions that happen in, an, in a young star, when a star comes, first comes together, the initial reaction is one of converting hydrogen to helium. We haven't heard about that happening since 20 minutes after the Big Bang. So there's this huge period of time, and stars don't form until quite late. Stars form about four, uh, 400 million years after the Big Bang. 400 million years is when the gas clouds can finally congeal because the universe is cooled enough and gravity can start that process of forming the stars. This is the process that, um, that happens in young stars and here's a picture of it. Four protons come together. It takes about a billion years for one proton to finally find that mate and form a deuteron and start the process of nucleosynthesis. But that one, billion, that one proton has to wait a billion years but there's lots of protons. So clearly there's lots going on in the sun right now. We don't have to wait around. But it's just interesting to note that the interaction time of that one proton is one billion years. Now, if it were much faster than that, what would happen? The star would burn out way too fast. What is it that causes that one, million, one billion year wait? It's a balance between the electrostatic repulsion and the quantum tunneling probability and the temperature, all of which, and the temperature comes from the balance between gravity and radiation pressure. So, all of these are remarkable convergences, what I call remarkable convergences, of the constants of nature coming together to form these systems that then support uh, life. However, those deuterons will meet up with additional protons in one second. The Coulomb barrier, the barrier for their electrostatic repulsion is much lower. They'll come together to form two helium-3s, and then those helium-3s will come together to form helium-4 in about a million years. So those heliums are wallflowers as well. They have to wait around. You know, this proton says, all right, I finally made it. And boy, look, I moved to the next stage, but now I've got to wait another million years before I form helium. <laughs> However, you should know that the sun converts 4 trillion kilograms of mass to pure energy per second. Th th that's a lot of protons, okay? That's a lot of protons being converted to helium and giving off 4 trillion kilograms worth of mass. Here's a, a process that happens in slightly heavier stars. We don't really need that. But in heavy, the heaviest stars, eventually the helium in the core that's building up as a result of that proton fusion uh, becomes the fuel because when the hydrogen fuel starts running out, the gravity, who's waiting slyly, will start compressing that star and increasing its temperature. And if the star is massive enough, it'll start burning helium into carbon. And the core temperature rises from about 20 million degrees Kelvin or 20 million Kelvin inside that massive star up to about 100 million Kelvin, and that's when the um, helium fusion starts happening. And then successive stages of stellar evolution produce these heavier and heavier elements until finally we reach iron. But there's one resonance here I'd like to mention, and I'm going to move quickly. 
I think time is actually sped up during these. There's a relativistic <laughs> effect. It's a relativistic effect. I think I'm being cheated of some time here. That clock is moving too fast. That's Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle scratched his head and said, wait a minute. Beryllium 8 lists, lasts for 10 to the minus 16 seconds. 10 to the minus 16. Do you have any idea how small that is? That's really small. Talk about small. Do you, how, do you know how long the lifetime of the Higgs boson is? The Higgs boson, you've got to give credit to those CERN physicists. The Higgs boson has a lifetime of 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Now, how short is that? Is that snap of a finger? Is it the blink of an eye? 10 to the minus 22 seconds is to one second as one second is to, it's, in, it's amazing, it's several, it's 10,000, about 10,000, yeah, it's 10,000. 10, wait around for 10,000 universe lifetimes and you've got the time relative to one second as our second is to 10 to the minus 22 seconds. So that's a very short, so 10 to the minus 16 is too short. And you saw that the things that happen in the star take billions of years to millions of years to maybe a couple of seconds. But how in the world is two helium atoms gonna come together to form beryllium-8 and that beryllium-8 to wait around long enough to come together with another helium to form carbon. It takes three alpha particles to form out carbon. However, carbon is ready and waiting because there is an excited state of carbon at 7.65 million electron volts that effectively causes those particles to suck together and form a carbon nucleus. If, if there's any helium in the vicinity of that beryllium, as soon as it forms, that triple alpha process can happen as a result of the fact that there's this resonance in carbon. Who put that resonance there? You fill in the blank. But it's there and we're thankful because otherwise nucleosynthesis in stars would not go past carbon or, or helium. And we would have a wonderful, rich, beautiful universe made of hydrogen and helium with nobody to enjoy it. So the carbon resonance there is an absolute miracle. I call it the miracle here. Fred Hoyle is the one who had the ability to think, wait a minute, there's something going on here. I bet there's a resonance in carbon. They went and looked for it and three years later they found it. There's also a resonance, by the way, in oxygen. But look, it's slightly offset in energy from the carbon resonance, and the good thing there is that the oxygen doesn't form fast enough so as to deplete, or it doesn't happen at the expense of the carbon, so the carbon can build up enough to set the stage for the future, um, re, uh, this future stages of the stellar evolution. So both carbon and, and oxygen resonances form gateways into which, or through which, the star can move to form all the heavier elements. Now finally, this is just a diagram showing that the heaviest of stars can actually go all the way up to iron. They can fuse all the way up to iron and it develops an iron core, but you can't go any further than iron because that's the end of the road. Iron is the most tightly bound nucleus. You cannot take two iron nuclei and throw them together and produce a heavier nucleus. You actually have to push them together. So then the question is, how does a star go beyond iron? And there's two ways, which I'm gonna very quickly review. There's the binding energy plot showing that iron is at the very bottom. If you want to produce all these other lovely atoms or nuclei, you have to find a way to put energy into the system. And that happens. Here's, by the way, uh, the Crab Nebula. This is where all the heavy elements are. We know they're there. Okay? It doesn't take too much to say, well, they're here. How did they get here? All the elements of the periodic table can be seen in spectroscopy of that nebula. Well, there's four processes, two of which I'm just going to make brief mention of, and that's the S process and the R process that happens inside stars. Both of these produce elements heavier than iron. So this is the last piece of the puzzle. The S process is a very slow process that happens over billions of years. The R process happens in the blink of an eye, in about a second. The S process is one by which the iron is sitting around in the core, but there are stray neutrons moving around. And those stray neutrons can stick. They like to stick to things. If you were at Sharon Stevenson's colloquium, she said neutrons like to stick to things. They stick to an iron nucleus, and then they form a radioactive iron nucleus. And that radioactive iron nucleus, take a look at this nickel. Nickel 62 is stable, but nickel 63 is not. So if a neutron sticks to nickel 62, it forms nickel 63, which promptly beta decays up to copper 63. All of a sudden, we have a heavier element. That copper 63 in time will accrete a neutron and form zinc 64. Or it can either beta or positron decay to either zinc or nickel, and then that nickel can accrete a neutron over a hundred, couple hundred years and beta decay to copper. So by this very slow, steady, this very slow progression toward heavier and heavier nuclei, nuclei, all of the elements up to your, well, not up to uranium, up to some fairly heavy region can be formed, but it takes a long time. Now there's also something called the R process, but the R process happens in explosive environments. It can only happen when you've got a tremendous cataclysmic event like a supernova. And there, there's all of a sudden too many neutrons to count, and they go up, 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 and they stick to nuclei faster than you can count, and they don't have a chance to decay until they've got all these neutrons accreted to them. 
then they start decaying away. And so what happens is you move way off the line of stability and you produce from iron 59 all the way up to iron 68, at which time you can't put any more neutrons on it and it starts beta decaying and then accreting more neutrons and beta decaying and accreting more neutrons until you form elements that are way off the line of stability. And in fact, if you look at this diagram right here, germanium 76, selenium 80, and selenium 82 cannot be produced by the S process because there's a gap of a nucleus that's too short-lived. And so the question is, where do they come from? They come from the R process. And we think that the R process happens in core collapse supernova and neutron star mergers. These are both very active areas of research in the astrophysics community, but they're also very interesting to the nuclear science community because those are the ground-based experiments that we have to do to piece together the puzzle. Here's a diagram showing the R process and the S process elements. Notice around the region of europium and then gold and platinum, we've got a, a plethora of R process elements that can't be produced by the S process. Gold and platinum are both produced in explosive astrophysical environments, not in the slow, steady progression of the S process. Kind of interesting. Makes them more rare, right? So here's the chart of the nuclides, the last one we're going to look at, with all of the astrophysical processes that are associated with populating the chart of the nuclides with the stuff that we need for life. Here's the supernova, but there's also X-ray bursts and nova and a P process and RP process, which we don't have time to talk about, that populate the left side of the diagram and ultimately give us all of the elements that we see here on Earth and in the solar system. So we do our research at Michigan State. This is a, um, a picture of the upgrade that's currently um, happening at Michigan State University. Here's a layout of the lab, and there's the hall that we do our experiments. And I'll just bri very briefly say that our study is to look at very neutron-rich nuclei, those ones that occur as a result of things like the R process, where you have lots of neutrons suddenly enter the system and produce very neutron-rich nuclei. We study the properties of those nuclei using an accelerator, the accelerator that uh, consists of those two cyclotrons, and we built some very large neutron detectors. There's MONA and there's LISA, two very large <laughs> neutron arrays that are built each out of 144 neutron detecting bars, and we can detect the neutrons that come from the decay of these nuclei. Here's uh, three of our Westmont students, Nathaniel, Allison, Nathaniel Taylor, Allison Barker, and Sierra Garrett. And then there's Alicia Palmazano, who was a student at Gettysburg College, one of Sharon's students, if you came to Sharon's talk, sitting in one of the new halls at Michigan State. Here's our room, and here's the number of papers that we've published so far in the region of those heavy, or those light neutron rich nuclei. So each of these colored spots here represents one of the nuclei that we either discovered or was already known, but we've, we measure the properties of. And there's a drip line that goes right down there. Drip line meaning if you add an extra neutron, it just falls right back off. But you can actually study nuclei beyond the drip line if you're clever. And I work with some very clever people. So we can actually study oxygen 28 right there. We have a proposal into the pack to study oxygen 28. Oxygen 24, that one right there, is the last particle stable nucleus, but we've actually studied 25 and 26. <coughs> okay, in summary, I want to summarize some of the remarkable convergences or fine tunings that we've seen here or we've seen alluded to. I'll leave it to other people to speculate about why those fine tunings occur, but it always benefits to stand back and say, whoa, that is really cool. And some of those are, okay, the four forces and their relative strengths. We know and are thankful for the variety of forces, but the strengths are really appropriate to the support of intelligent life because they allow stars to burn, produce elements, and then other lighter stars to burn and form the kind of time periods that allow life to form. Uh, the relative strength of the weak force and the decay governs the lifetimes. Look at the lifetime of the neutron and the way in which it gives the right ratio of hydrogen and helium to allow for those future stars to form and the life cycles that support life to um, happen. Uh, the cosmogenesis and the quarks and leptons, the substructure of the nucleons, hadronization of quarks into nucleons, there's the neutron half-life and the hydrogen and helium abundances, the carbon and oxygen resonances. As a nuclear physicist, I'm aware of other resonances that occur that are also narrow gateways that allow marching up that periodic table that I don't have time to go into. And finally, there's this one, which I think is perhaps the most remarkable. Gravity is so obscenely weak compared with the other forces, but it's just right to allow for the balance, the isostatic equilibrium in a star that allows for the inward pressure and the outward pressure to balance to form just the right burning rate, the nuclear burning rate, and the right lifetimes to support life. Life doesn't pop out of nowhere. It takes time to develop the environment in which that life can dwell and, and increase in complexity. 
And so the, the life cycle and duration of stars by their nuclear burning is the one that I find, in some sense, the most fascinating. But it all came out of that symmetry breaking that we call the Big Bang. And so out of those 12 particles and four forces, we now have a rich universe because we know that there's more than just the 12 particles. There's lots of symmetry breaking, there's lots of complex interactions of those forces, and there are remarkable features that grow out of those particles into emergent structures that have life-giving capability, for example, the stars, and eventually the biosphere. So there's a, a really cool story from my vantage point. I hope you find it a fun story and an inspiring story. Thank you for your attention.